Thank you very much for coming this evening uh, to take part in our continuing conversation about central Barangaroo. My name is Tony Rankin and I look after community and stakeholder relations at the authority, the Barangaroo Delivery Authority. On behalf of the authority, I would like to acknowledge that the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation are the traditional custodians of the land and water on which we are working. We pay our respects to the elders past and present as we carry out this significant work on their country. You will have seen from the invitation there are two topics for this evening's conversation. The first is the Central Barangaroo Master Plan and the upcoming planning application which will seek to amend the Barangaroo Concept Plan as it relates to Central Barangaroo. This is followed by an update on construction of the Headland Park and the proposal to demolish the former Sydney Ports Harbour Control Tower. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions at uh, a couple of different occasions during the evening and, and we'll let you know as those arise. So now I would like to introduce you to the CEO of the Brengaroo Delivery Authority, John Tabart, who's going to um, welcome everybody this evening. Thanks very much, Tony, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to have people like Tony involved over five years in sort of talking to the community on behalf of uh, the BDA and uh, talking about the evolving plans for Barangaroo, which of course now are very much a reality. This is the latest in the program of discussions with the community about central Barangaroo. The master plan discussion started about 18 months ago and uh, we appointed uh, an international master planning organisation, Skidmore, Angs and Merrill from Chicago, to work with the team to develop the master plan in January um, last year. So this is the latest and this is an important one because it's the latest information about the master plan and it's also um, part of the explanation of the application to modify the concept plan while maintaining the heights in central Barangaroo, maintaining the footprint of buildings, but providing for a greater diversity of opportunity of uses, all about activating and creating a more active space for the people of Sydney. So central Barangaroo starts from that um, tall image of the um, Barangaroo South, the Crown Resort, and goes to the left of the slide to the completion of the northern cove in front of, central, in front of the Headland Park. So that's a five hectare parcel of which 50% is public open space. Barangaroo is now, as many of you are very well aware, um, a place of construction, 1.5 kilometres in length and 400 metres at its sort of widest point, 200 metres at its widest point um, of construction along the entire 22 hectares. So it really is coming together. Um, the Headland Park is on track for completion uh, in mid-2015, as is Len Lease advises their first tower, the Westpac Tower, also planned for opening in mid-2015. So at the same time, a significant commercial development for the financial services industry in the CBD and a significant public outcome at the same time will open together. Central Barangaroo is the last piece of Barangaroo to be defined. And the master planning that's occurred over the last 18 months and the application which has now been submitted, please join as you arrive, um, is now a part of a public planning application process. Tonight we're going to hear about that master plan and about the application. A key feature of the master plan, as you'll see, uh, what has been named nominally at this time as the Sydney Steps, steps that will take people from the Barangaroo waterfront, 50% public open space, up to High Street, and then of course via the Agar Steps, we'll be actually connecting for the first time the Observatory Hill Park land with a waterfront park land, a very significant result of the development of central Barangaroo. These steps will bisect the development of Barangaroo um, in that five hectares of space. While the, pl the planning process is underway, we're also uh, are commencing a expressions of interest process, both for developers who may be interested in development of central Barangaroo and for tenants and end users who may desire to be part of the space. 
that allows the authority to put together tenant interests and developer uh, proposals to see exactly what the best and most creative ideas are to achieve that outcome. A key objective of the expressions of interest process is to add activities and diversity to Barangaroo itself. So we have a very significant recreational space at the Headland Park. We have a very active financial services space in Barangaroo South. What we need to do with Central Barangaroo is add diversities of interest which will bring more and more people to the waterfront of the CBD in the Barangaroo precinct. And we're relying upon proposals from the private sector and public interests and others to put that together as part of the expressions of interest process. But tonight is about, in fact, the master planning and the, um, and the development of the application for the modification to the concept plan. So I've forgotten these slides, but this shows you a little bit about the advancing construction of Headland Park, and Peter Walker is here this week, and his team. Some of those are here tonight. Another shot that really shows how significant, how progressed that is. In 18, in 12 months, that will be completed and fully planted with 70,000 plants that are in nurseries currently in Gosford. And this shows you the division between central Barangaroo um, and Barangaroo South. So Barangaroo South, the area that Len Lease are developing and potentially the site for the Crown uh, project, which is of course going through a planning application of its own separately. And here is central Barangaroo, here is the 50% open space and here is the developable footprint that we'll be talking about tonight. Thanks John. Uh, next we're going to hear from two gentlemen who've been working very closely together on the central Barangaroo master plan. David McCracken from the Barangaroo Delivery Authority and Doug Voigt from the Authority's Central Barangaroo Master Planners, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, a firm that's highly regarded internationally for the work that they uh, do around the world and um, would like to welcome David and Doug to come up and tell us about the master plan. It's great having Doug up here because I get all the dry slides with the words and Doug gets all the nice photo slides with the drawings. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction on the, um, the initial vision and, and positioning of, of Central Barangaroo. It is the last remaining parcel. It's the central piece of the site, as John indicated. It's 5.2 hectares. It's about um, 200 meter, 290 metres long and about 180 metres um, wide. It has a present planning application for about 60,000 square metres of gross, gross floor area and that is predominantly residential and commercial with a small amount of amenity and, um, and civic space. It has approximately 53,000 square, sorry, 53% public open space and we have set that as a very clear guideline in the work um, that we've set out in the brief that we've given to the master plan team. Um, this is some vision, there's a lot of words there, but the, the, the vision for Central, it is undefined at the moment. We're working with a variety of people, as John indicated, with the development industry as well as with key uses to evolve that mix. But we do want to have a place of which it has its own character. It's a place that's bold, it's a place that's creative, it's got diversity in it, it's got a grain that's a unique to its place rather than the urban footprint of Barangaroo South. But it's also contextually located within the Millers Point Walsh Bay precinct, so it has to have have a, a, a personality and a character and a scale that's re reminiscent of the harbour and of its area. Importantly, the second last point, it has to be loved locally but recognised globally. It has got a global mandate and global ambition, but it has to work for the locals here in Sydney. Part of the objectives that we set, we set out to achieve here um, from the place was to provide a platform for a diversity of product, of diversity of uses and diversity of activities that will allow for vibrancy and, and um, um, pop population throughout the day and the week. It's not a place where it should just be a residential enclave where people leave to go to work, nor should it be a place just of work. It has to have public attraction and amenity, and it has to have impact from day one, and that's very important in the way we've staged the planning for the, for the precinct. From a... Um, design objectives, 
it is very clearly a civic and culturally significant place and a, and a, and a place that has to link along the, the ribbon of Sydney, the public waterfront that links the Opera House and the Botanic Gardens all the way around through Darling Harbour and makes a 14 kilometre waterfront walk that's relatively level and a great, a great unique global attraction. Um, range of passive and active um, uses. It has to be able to be enjoyed when there are program activities. It has to be able to be enjoyed when it's just passive recreation. Um, the first step in, in conclusion for us is, is we set out a master plan to, to um, the SOM team who were selected through a ex quite exhaustive international search. We set out a brief and we had respondents from about 50 parties, broke it down to 20, came down to seven to to, um, to three, and SOM were selected. One of the things that, that SOM recognised from, from their first impression of this project was creating a framework for others to do excellent work. And that's really been the way they've shaped this master plan. You'll see some architectural imagery here tonight, but that's, a, that's about one particular way someone may interpret this precinct. It's not about the architecture tonight, it's about the, the framework and the planning guidelines that have been created. So, so I'll introduce um, Doug now to talk to you about his experiences in January and February of 2013. Thanks, David. Um, first of all, uh, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight and giving us the opportunity to share our work and the progress uh, we've had over the last couple of months and since the last time, I believe it was my colleague, uh, partner Phil Enquist, who perhaps met with many of you in a similar forum. Um, but also, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to escape what's been an otherwise dreadfully long winter in Chicago. And it's great to be back here in Sydney. And stand away from that. Uh, for us, the real challenge is to meet and exceed the bar that you as Sydney Siders have set in terms of what it means to live in a highly vibrant and global city. And what that means to us as a design team, developing a framework to further contribute to the meaningful places and activities within the city. And many of these ideas came out of those early conversations. The ideas of creating an urban theater, a place for civic attraction at the waterfront, but also ensuring that we balance the right mix of use so that this is a highly desirable and livable place to both work and play. And that ultimately this success will be measured by the intensity of interaction that we're able to foster within an urban framework of not only new buildings, but incredibly meaningful and valuable public space. Clearly opening up the opportunities for program as this thing clicks and further contribute to this city's great urban fabric. So earlier this year we had shared I think with many of you some early directions of how that would influence our thinking. Understanding the importance as David mentioned before but also that what we do in Central had to be bold. It had to test the boundaries of what development could do, what urban design could do to improve the quality of life and attraction along the waterfront. We understand the importance of this commitment and incredible design that Pete Walker and his team's given us to look collectively at the entire waterfront from the Headland Park all the way down to Barangaroo South. But understanding that the buildings that eventually reside within Central have the unique opportunity to be more than just commercial or residential buildings. They provide an opportunity to look at new ways to bring civic amenity, to bring cultural anchors within the development itself. We understand the importance of views given the context and the rich history of the site, both from the buildings themselves, but also from the context of Miller's Point and Observatory Hill. This calls into question, how do we look at the rooftops, not just the facades of buildings, but that which you'll probably see and actually we hope have the experience to participate in, that which is green roofs as an extension of the public domain. Early on, we met with Paul Keating, who had some very thoughtful words and to us as a design team in that it had to be of the harbor. It had to reflect the history, but also the character and the texture. You can see this evident in the progress of Headland Park 
but this should continue into the thinking and encouragement to future designers to the buildings and other public spaces. So this is a summary of the consultation we've had, the engagement, and many of the informal discussions we've had with many of you and your fellow citizens uh, through the nine to 12 months we've been working here uh, in Sydney. Oh, there's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> um, great feedback. Uh, incredibly important for us to, again, understand what it really means to unlock the keys, uh, sorry, to identify the keys, to really unlock the full potential of the site. And what we found was it was more than just architecture. It was more than just design. It was about the foundation of program and thinking of what went into all of those spaces that we would inhabit moving forward. Interestingly, they fell into two general categories through these discussions. The idea of creating urban theater, civic gathering at the waterfront, but also the important for green space, characterized as a harbor park. But interestingly, even in the condition of a harbor park, the character was more urban than passive and pastoral. And so that's important to note that with Headland Park and the other activities further to the south, the design of the public domain within Central provides a unique opportunity of how we bring these two together in what could be a more urban and civic gathering space. Many thoughts from you. I'm not going to challenge you to turn your head and read these, but uh, what the character and quality of those spaces should reflect. Now, all of this went into thinking related to how do we start to organize the site? How do we continue to advance the commitment of open space and development, but do it in a way that further brings opportunity to the site? We aren't designing in an island. In fact, Barangaroo Central, or Central Barangaroo, is that last piece. It has the task of bringing all of these assets and resources together in an incredibly diverse ecology within the city. I'll find it. There you go. Uh, but also understanding that the design of the waterfront, working with Pete Walker and his team, I know Pete will speak later as well, how do we contribute to this incredible journey along the waterfront, creating a destination here that is unique, but complementary to that experience of being on the foreshore? Important to recognize that being on the waterfront is part of what it means to experience Sydney. But within this part of the city, how you get to the waterfront, but also how do you make your way back into the city is equally important. And there's been many discussions already in terms of the role Argyle Street has in connecting to the Headland Park, as well as Wynyard Walk connecting uh, more to the CBD. As John mentioned before, the role that High Street plays and these other connections provide opportunity to further explore the waterfront in a very accessible manner. And this led us to another idea, and I, I should just share, this is beyond our remit, but it does suggest that if through Central we bring the idea of the Sydney Steps, a passage all the way up to Kent Street, directly across that street are the Agar Steps which lead up to Observatory Hill. That's fantastic. It really brings the front door of Observatory Hill down to Kent Street. But really, we should think bigger. We should understand how we can connect to all the other cultural assets and amenities that reside within this part of the city. And is there an idea to create, as we've been calling it, a B2B walk, an easier way, complementary to the foreshore, that could connect Barangaroo to Benalong? Oops. That was quick. The idea of the Sydney Steps, again, this is the idea of creating that civic gathering space, creating a new entry point to the site from uh, High Street at Kent Street right here, leading down to stairs that would cascade down to the waterfront, but in a way that is Sydney and allows for gathering uh, and attraction. Those lead to the plaza itself, and we've had many discussions. What type of programs would we like to see in here? And much like our experience at Millennium Park in Chicago, if you identify the space within a framework plan or within a master plan, great things can happen. We engaged Jaume Plenza in the design of Crown Fountain in Chicago. 
working with the Pritzker family, we're able to bring in Frank Gehry to design the Pritzker Pavilion and the great band shell that perhaps many of you have seen. How does this space provide that opportunity to create another unique destination within Sydney, known throughout the world? But that alone should complement the other activities and uses we have and are proposing along the western foreshore. And this is another idea that came about looking at the public domain and the importance that culture has in the daily lives of you all as Sydney siders. The importance uh, and significance that Walsh Bay has, but also Observatory Hill. And with the space underneath the Headland Park, as well as the old Bond building, could we look at additional cultural uses that start to gravitate around the North Cove, creating that sort of destination as a cultural campus uh, directly accessible to the water. Mm. And so from this early exploration, from those loose sketches, we're able to identify a couple of key principles. And I want to just highlight a few because they're important to recognize the stage of design which we're in. And that is as refining the master plan, the urban design framework, uh, it's in yellow, but the idea of identifying the right scale, grain, density, and urban form. So when we talk about increasing density, it's to really increase the intensity of interaction that's able to be supported in this important waterfront. It also allows us to deliver greater diversity of product. So we have the opportunity to look at new ways where commercial, residential, cultural, community functions can all work together within one block and that we continue to find ways to be culturally distinctive in how we look at those blocks and we challenge the architects to be innovative in the performance of the buildings and the ability to follow through on the climate positive commitment. Thank you, Doug. There, there is um, an opportunity now to ask some questions about um, where we've got up to in this point in the process. Harold. Did you perchance happen to see the community submission that went to Phil, a copy of which of course went to various government officials here, pointing out the difficulties that had been experienced with the one public concert that was held in that area yes. and created havoc within the entire community for people present who aren't familiar with what happened. There was a pop concert, best way to put it, that effectively drove people from their homes all along the front side of Millers Point, from one end to the other. The area was uninhabitable at the time. Even the noise came to the extent that even within the high-rise buildings that are double glazed, and they were double glazed for protection against the noise of the wharves in the first place, people could not stay within their apartments. And notwithstanding this and the various submissions that have been made, it appears that you have, maybe the government has, a determination to go ahead with a sound stage in the same location, with the future development of even closer residential and future havoc. Thanks, Harold. Um, David, I think it might be more appropriate if you answer that question just in terms of the general intent of Central Brangaroo. The authority has acknowledged the issues with vans and, and apologised about the unintended impacts, Harold, and we certainly said that we would take into account um, all the feedback we received in relation to that concert in when we received future event applications and when we are determining what kinds of events will happen in, in Central Barangaroo. Exactly what form um, the Central Barangaroo public area will take. Well, David, do you want to comment on that? You've answered it, you've answered it pretty well. The, one of the key, the key drivers that has informed um, the work that Doug and, and, and his team have, have done has been about an active waterfront and about a need for a desire for opportunities to gather around that waterfront in a variety of ways. The Headland Park does that. Um, any events that are, that, are, that are planned in the future will have guidelines around them. What we have done is create a variety of spaces within the master plan 
that allow various scales of things to happen. Um, and you make an interesting point about the adjacency to um, future development and the delineation between them and the controls. And they'll obviously be informed both ways, from the development to the activities zone, as well as from the activities back to development. But there are a range of potential uses. All of them will be subject to the right parameters and controls and approvals prior to their, prior to their um, uh, implementation. There's no permanent soundstage plan. There is a space plan, and you'll see it in some of the design work in the, in the future that, is, that it, the, has had a, a title of urban theatre you'll see on these drawings. It is meant to be a gathering space, but it's not a permanent infrastructure space similar um, to a Maya music bowl or, or, or a permanent place for a soundstage. There may be at times during the day an appropriate time where there are um, infrastructure brought in temporarily for particular events. But it could be anything from a symphony orchestra to a, to a, um, uh, a beach volleyball or to, to um, a, any sort of public gathering. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, the gentleman with the green shirt. I'm trying to get a handle on what has happened with the uh, Southern Cove. It seems to, like if we look at the piece of literature you've handed out, the Southern Cove is still quite a sizeable indent, but on these drawings, the Southern Cove's almost disappeared. Is that correct? So the Southern Cove is part of the Lend Lease area, yep. uh, Barangaroo South. Um, John, is that something that you would like to comment on briefly? Yeah, could we just go back to a slide that's got it up? back at the beginning of the press. So, as Tony said, um, independently of the application we're talking about tonight for central Barangaroo, Lend Lease are preparing an application to amend the concept plan for southern Barangaroo. And you can see the space here, the southern cove they're proposing has changed shape. This has been on uh, display and exhibition at our offices since September last year. And there's a model there that shows as well, many of you may well have seen that. So they're proposing to change the shape of the Southern Cove um, and it provides a variety of different green spaces. So you can see on this plan, can I have the, yeah, thank you very much. Then Lease will go into some length with their consultation but they've created a new park, uh, hasn't had a name yet but perhaps Hickson Park which is the largest single space apart from the central space, public space in central Barangaroo that we'll be talking about tonight. So that's one space. Uh, there's another space around the Southern Cove and they'll make their own proposals with regard to that. Today we're talking about this section and I think just to enhance a bit of the question about whether there will be events or what sort of events they'll be, our task is to make sure there's a variety of spaces that can be used for different things around and of course they can be programmed for a variety of things and that's something that comes you know, a year and a half and beyond over the next seven years in the development of the operations and the programming of the space and of course sensitivity to noise and particular sorts of events is going to have to be taken into account by every application. We've had something like 30 events in Barangaroo on the waterfront in the last four years since the waterfront was actually be actively opened in November 2009. And one of those events has made a significant impact on the local residents and that's been understood and obviously something is going to be carefully planned in any future events that may be available. But there is no permanent sound stage as you've described it, but there are spaces where many things could happen. Thank you, John. Um, yes, this gentleman here. That there will be an expression of interest from private um, companies, you know, people about um, various usage of the central Barangaroo. So could you please elaborate on the process, how we can get engaged, how, what's the process, how we can... So we will be coming to that, that's in the next section. So um, David will talk about that in the next section. So all your questions hopefully will be answered then. Uh, yes, um, just there, I guess, thank you. Thanks. Thank now. you. Um, my name is Nathan English. I'm a planning student at UNSW and I'm, I'm also a public transport advocate with Ecotransit. Um, I've been to most of these 
consultation periods over the last couple of years for Barangaroo. And, and the one thing that I've always pushed, because I believe that it's also key to creating a vibrant um, community, be it at the waterfront or where have you, is good connectivity and public transport. Um, time and time again, uh, in relation to Barangaroo, we've put forward proposals. We have a very um, uh, weighty investment to try and get Barangaroo connected to the inner west light rail line via an underwater tunnel and all that sort of thing. We've put this to the Barangaroo Delivery Authority time and time again. It might seem like pie in the sky sort of investment, but for the sort of investment that's taking place at Barangaroo, I know we're talking about Barangaroo Central specific, but this is the central area of this entire catchment now. Um, and it's also the last piece of terra firma that will be developed as part of Barangaroo. Um, I, I've never seen another plan which actually tackles this issue um, quite the way that we've tried to do it comprehensively to bring this place alive with um, connectivity other than walking. The Wynyard Walk is a sizable investment, sure, but Wynyard Station is also arguably at capacity now, and this is going to have tens of thousands of people extra into the area at times where there's going to be entertainment um, events on. These people could get stranded at Barangaroo short of catching buses and taxis out of the area or, you know, the southern end ferries, but that, that also is something which is yet to be confirmed. So my question is, why is the Barangaroo Delivery Authority not more aggressively seeking help with this issue and leaving it as an unspoken one um, in relation to the New South Wales government and the future of this site in general? Because I believe that public transport could be a huge help with making this a success. Um, I've heard about tonight about the walking paths. I commend that it should be all of these things. But a lot of people also don't find walking easy. Um, and these, uh, uh, unlike Manhattan, for example, and its waterfront and its areas, uh, that's a flat island for most of its area and it, it lends itself to walking. Sydney, in a lot of places, for a lot of people, will not. And this is no exception, although the waterfront land has been um, flat. So my, my up question is, essentially, why is this remaining a silent issue? Why is there not more being made of it? Um, because uh, if sound is an issue for local residents, then I would think that Hickson Road and um, thousands of people stranded will also be an issue sound-wise into the future if, if it's only buses that are being relied on. Um, we've seen that George Street is having light rail put down it. That would be an excellent argument to try and extend into Barangaroo, but I do not hear that from the BDA, and I'm concerned as to why that is. You can put extra development to create vibrancy. To some extent, that may be a valid argument, and it will bring the place alive, but so will public transport, and, and something elegant, something like light rail, or even you know its own train station. But why is the conversation not being had? Uh, thank you. We'll take most of those comments on board. Um, I can certainly assure you that the authority has extensive conversations and planning underway with Transport for New South Wales. David or John, is there something you would like to add to that? Thank you. So, firstly, thanks for the question and thanks for your submissions. Um, aggressive isn't something that the authority has been accused of on a regular basis, you're right. But we have been working strongly with um, the public transport authorities in this uh, state, uh, both under the previous government and under the current government. And there is a variety of solutions. Firstly, we advocated a loop uh, line from Circular Quay that would enhance the uh, George Street solution from Central to Circular Quay. And we advocated a loop line that would come around through Walsh Bay and would connect Barangaroo to Walsh Bay and would correct connect, in fact, to, um, uh, to Darling Harbour and then back to Central. Um, the costs of that uh, became prohibitive in any sort of sensible um, relationship to the volume of people that would use it versus, in fact, uh, the cost of doing it. Um, it's been defaulted, that particular one has been defaulted to a dedicated bus lane and we're now having the discussions and arguments about how that dedicated lane can get through Sussex Street, but that's on our program to advocate strongly. And it would do the same linkage from Circular Quay through past Barangaroo to um, Darling Harbour and beyond to, uh, to Central. 
So let's just, just add up what we do have, and this is the right plan to show it. It's 200 metres from the Wynyard Station platforms directly to Barangaroo. 250 metres to this portion of central South Barangaroo. Uh, we've had 15,000 people visit the um, New Year's Eve fireworks in 2011, I think, <coughs> evening. And the <coughs> they, in the main, came by train and then on bus and then walked from without the benefits of, of, um, of Wynyard Walk to the space to use the public spaces. So it can be, I agree that doesn't work for everybody, but that's supplemented by a bus service that came and then to Central would be an excellent solution to sort of help service this area. Um, the other issue is ferries. We've been a strong advocate of having ferry services. We've designed three separate ferry terminals. Perhaps one of those should be available soon after the opening of the first buildings in Barangaroo South and we're advocating that strongly with the Department of Transport. So what actually happens, I guess, will unfold with time as their plan becomes more certain to turn dates and times. The, uh, the platforms you mentioned in Wynyard, and those platforms, we are assured, have a program to be supplemented and improved in capacity by the time that Barangaroo South has got two or three buildings occupied. OK. OK. We do need to get back on topic and there will be opportunities for more questions, but we need to continue with the presentation. There will be two more opportunities for questions. Um, when it's New Year's Eve, most of the city isn't operating the way it normally would as far as getting people in and out. It is easy to create these corridors with buses then, but on a daily basis I'd argue that that isn't necessarily going to work so well. And this is a very big area from north to south. Yeah, okay, thank you, and we, we hear the point. So. Um, I think we do need to get back to the presentation. 